Okay, so what I'm going to do, a little different today, I'm going to read this verse, and then I'm going to have a social time, so all of you that want to run for the hills have a, have a way to get out. No? Oh, Vicky says no, so you're just going to have to live with it. All right? So let me read it, and then realize I could have got out of here. No. But you don't want to miss this. But if you did, I just was, What? <laughs> I was just being nice. I was going to let him out. This is tough. All right, so here we go. Chapter 21, verse 1. And he, Jesus, looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. <laughs> See what I'm saying? And, I, and he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they all out of their surplus put into the offering. But she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. I mean, oh yes, there's more. And while some were take, talking about the temple that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will be not not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down. And so he's saying all this wealth and riches that you're looking at, your eyes are upon, there's a day coming they'll have meant nothing. They will be nothing. You have served them all your life and they will dissolve. You have trusted in them and they will disappear. They won't serve you. Wonderful verses all over the Bible about he who seeks to Save his life will lose it. He who seeks to build his life, it will come crashing down. But he who puts himself on this rock, the wind will come, the waves will rise, the storms will beat, and that house will stand because it's on the rock. And the rock he's talking about is what this widow is building her house on. And it's, uh, it's wonderful because it's an offering, and we just took an offering. And I, you know... In my life, I, this has really meant a lot to me. I, let, I literally hear stories all the time. This is, a, this is a fabulous offering scripture. In fact, today would have been far better had we took the offering after the sermon, right? Because no matter what, we have to pay our bills. But I don't trust in offerings to pay the bills. I trust in the Lord. And I'm not trying to get your money. It has been many times in my life trying to teach people to give and to learn to live trusting the Lord that I have challenged people to give a certain amount in offering of their life, making sure that it's more than they can afford to give away. They cannot make it. Like, I mean, Nicole just said it. I can't pay my bills anyway. So I better do something that would put me in a position to trust you. And I've told them, you know, that after three months, if they want it back, they can have it all back. And no one's ever come back to give it back because the Lord is faithful. Now, this woman, she's giving what's called uh, two lepka. So it was the tiniest little, thinnest little silver piece or copper piece. Copper, I think it was. And it's almost useless. And so you and I call it pennies. And in some translations called mites. But it was actually a coin called a lepka. And she had two. And maybe she could eat for a day on it. She could split her food up and maybe eat for more than a day, maybe two days. But it would be a bite. Now, I know here in America, we, a bite is not what we call eating. <laughs> but it is what they called eating on a regular basis. We have no concept of poor and, poor and rich. and you know The poorest people in our community would be phenomenally wealthy people in their time. You don't really worry, too, not too many of us worry that we won't be able to eat until we die. We're not going to starve to death. Even if we go hungry for a minute, we know there's always relief out there. And uh, so for her, in her time, that isn't true. When she gave her two copper coins, she was saying, I'm putting my all in. And that's what Jesus said. He said, she put in all that she had to live on. So I, you know, it's, it's, 
honestly one of those verses you should be able to read, say good day, have a great day, and everybody should go home and just honestly wonder about their life without any sermon. And I, I, I mean, it really should say that to us. But, but the problem is that these words, this book doesn't change us. It's just next week there'll be another sermon and we can forget this one. Can you remember last week's? So if you follow me, it's like we just wait. We, we get here at the Father's House, the team, they get no less than four a week. It's so easy to forget the last one. And when we read things like this and Jesus saying stuff like, if you can't give everything, you can't be my disciple. See, we'll get to that in there. You stay 16 years and you'll hear that because it's in here. And we will go around again every 16 years or so these gospels and we will read those verses but you in your life ought to be reading these verses every few months at least and they say if you do not love me more than your mother your father your brother your sister your sons your daughters I mean did you hear the names I just said you hear the people I just talked about those are in a verse right in here and he says you cannot be my disciple what does that mean I can't be your disciple I'm, I'm saved, aren't I? Well, no. What it means is you cannot be saved. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If you are my disciple, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Only disciples are being set free, and only disciples are learning truth. And you can't be my disciple. But see, I don't like it saying that, so let's just wait till next week. There'll be another sermon coming along. Maybe one I can put into practice for a little bit, or maybe I can do it half-heartedly. And someone says to me, I'm doing it really good, but aren't you living with someone you're not married to? I mean, Paul even brings that up. If you read Paul's writings, he talks about that. This can't work out good for you. Well, I don't like that sermon. Let's just wait for another one. I don't like those words. Let's turn the page. There it is. If God is for me, who can be against me? Yeah, let's do that one. Well, who's me in that verse? And what's if mean in that verse? If God is for me. Are you positive that you fit into that verse? I want to be positive. I work work every day of my life. I want to make sure. I'm doing what these verses say, and she gave out of her, she gave all that she had to live. And I, I hear, I, I know, I know it really does, it really does come down to, you know, this faith thing. It really comes down to, do I believe that he takes care of me, or do I believe that I take care of me? It's a really comfortable place to get to the point, well, I don't really need to trust the Lord, because I got plenty saved up. My retirement's going to be okay baby because I have made a lot of money I have assets galore I don't need him until I do and then I say please please send Lazarus with some water touch my tongue even just a sponge of vinegar would help no, you in your life, you, you, you decided these things. And Lazarus sat outside your gate. Do you know the story I'm talking about? Lazarus, I mean, these stories, it's, well, I don't like that story. Well, let's just wait for another one. People who have little, in my estimation, give a lot. They give a lot. To have a church full of millionaires, would, you would almost go broke have a church full of people on social on social security and fixed incomes you can count on your income might not be a lot but you can count on it you know what's going to be in that offering because people who don't have anything they got to trust god people who have a lot well I, we don't really even have to get up to the line to worry about it i got it handled and i'm like people who love much uh, 
they're forgiven a lot. People who don't love much aren't forgiven a lot. People who love much forgive others a lot because they love. They make room for others. It's like, so wait, these two pennies. I literally know people. I mean, I have literally in my 48 years, I've, in church ministry, I've, I've seen, I can't say I've seen it all, but I've seen a lot. I know people who would be begging during the offering, hey, you got two pennies? Dead serious. To give two pennies in the offering. You know, if you get it from someone else, it isn't you giving it. And two, why two pennies? Because Jesus blessed this woman. So your whole life, you're out there just running amok, doing what you want to do, living how you want to live. You spend 50 to $200 a week on dope. And you come to church and you want to give two pennies. Are you, how do you feel about your relationship with God? I give my two mites. I give my two pennies. Seriously, that's what you think that said? That's what you think it takes? I heard a sermon one time about you, uh, what you value is on the walls of your house. You know, so you'll have like John Wayne up there saying, courage is being scared to death, but sat on up anyway, you know. That's what you value, the manly arts of saddling up when you're scared, you know. That's what, you'll have, what you believe in your heart you'll have on your walls. I, I, I know a guy who preaches that a lot. You'll wear, it on your, you'll wear it on your T-shirt. You'll have it on your bumper sticker. And one of the people that I know following him who lives pretty immoral, totally immoral, has many children who are just completely abandoned, said, no, we're okay. We have Jesus on our wall. We have a pic our picture of Jesus on the wall. It's like, this is how you came about your faith? This is what you think faith is? You read these verses and then you think that's what it means? That if you have a picture of Jesus on your wall, it doesn't matter how you live? And does this, and, and like, is it, is it like you give your two cents so you've qualified? Okay, you, we can skip that sermon because I qualify. I do my two cents. No, but do you give from what you need to live? Do you give out of your need? Like, do you make sure that you can't take care of you? Or do you make sure that you can take care of you? Does that make sense? That's what this verse is about. And it's not just about money, it's about time. I don't have time. Hey, I haven't seen you at church lately. I don't have time. I do nothing but work. Well, I, I, having a, been a man that worked a lot in my life, <laughs> I, I still went to church. So I work it out. I scheduled you for Sundays every week. Well, then you're going to have to find someone else. If you wanted to keep me, I told you I don't work Sunday mornings. I'll come at one, I'll come at two, but I don't work Sunday mornings. That's my, my line I won't cross. Part of a church. This book changes me. Worship. Worship. Did you give your two mites of worship or did you give all that you have? You see how it just can be worked into every, every subject there is? My devotion, my fear. Did you, give, did you lay two mites of your fear at the altar or did you lay all your fear at the altar? I trust in you to take care of me. Yes? You understand? Got these, uh, got these pictures from Pakistan this week. I'm, I'm trying to speak their name and identify them less because they're under heavy per persecution. And so they have these uh, farm. They have a farm. And it's to, it's, they don't have a farm to, be, to say we're farmers and wear the belt buckles and the, sh and the boots. They have a farm to stay alive because it's hard for Christians to even get enough to eat to buy food for their, their congregations. And so they're, they're attacking Christian businesses and tearing them down and they're burning in the streets and they're, they're just scared. They're worried. And, and all of a sudden their landlord with the farm took, gave them like a week to get out, two weeks to get out. So I asked them, uh, what do they need to keep the cows alive? What do they need to keep the chickens alive? And they said they need uh, nine or 10,000 U.S. dollars. And so we were up to 5,000 raised. 
And it just amazes me. It's like, I need another $5,000. But who would I call for that? Who, who would I call for that? Who would I say, hey, I, I need $5,000 to save a whole church's food chain? A church preaching the gospel in the darkest place on earth. And they live in it every day. And they have the greatest faith and they worship with great abandon. It's, it's hard on my ears to hear their music, but, <laughs> but for them, they worship with abandon. They just love the Lord. And uh, they trust in Him. And I'm asking the Lord, could I be, uh, could I help? Can, can, can you use me? And so I think about that. Why is that so hard? Because $5,000 isn't that much. Why is that hard for the Christian church? I wonder, it's like, do we serve? Let's serving. Like, what percentage of my life do I serve with? Well, hey, can you volunteer at Mud Run? I'm so busy. I don't have time. How much time do you have to give to the Lord? Can you volunteer in the nursery? Can you come down and help us during the week? Because that's nobody has time. The offerings of the church is all over America. The whole nation, the offerings of the church are down through COVID and never came back. Everybody got scared and everybody went in. Attendance to churches down all over the nation. Volunteerism completely wiped out. Why? Because they got afraid. God won't take care of me. One reason. The other is I don't need it. Since they wouldn't let us meet, and we didn't meet, and we didn't come together, and I didn't have a church, I found out I don't need it. Well, yeah, but you haven't stood before the judgment seat of Christ yet either. You haven't let these words change you either. You haven't even moved forward an inch and given one penny. Literally, there's people that don't give a penny. And most of us in the room have more than a penny. But we don't share. I've cried for 30 some years. Where is the book of Acts church? Where is the book of Acts church, Lord? Why don't you want to do here what you did there? It was my prayer crying out, How long, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord, will we wait to see you move like you did in the days of the apostles, like you did in the book of Acts? You know what he said to me? craziest thing I ever heard. I say that a lot though, but it is, this one was the craziest thing I ever heard. I said, you're all confused. I said, confused? They might be, but I'm not confused. I mean, like, I was like, well, I'm incredulous. What do you mean confused? What does that mean I'm confused? And he said, you're constantly trying to live two covenants as one. And you're constantly trying to trust in yourself and then say you trust in me. And this, little, this story is about a widow's might. He's trying to tell the religious people of his day. He's still in. He's still with the religious people. He's trying to tell them, you won't trust in me. You'll only trust in you. You make shows of giving, but you never give to the point where you have to trust me. You never serve to the point where you have to trust me. You never sacrifice to the point where you have to trust me. And until you trust me, you don't get what I have. Isn't that crazy? <sighs> you just got to read that story and you go, ah, uh, let's turn the page. This isn't good. <laughs> like, could this be encouraging? Well, I got an idea. This is actually has the ability to be tremendously encouraging. If you trust in the Lord, it says he will repay you. He says the offerings you give will have a 30-fold return, a 60-fold return, a 90-fold return. And let me just explain this. It's not a, vend a money vending machine. Let's see. If, if there was a money vending machine up here with $10 bills for $2, $5 bills for $1, $100 bills for $5, 
You'd never keep that $100 thing full. People would be there all day sticking five. You'd have to go get changed 25s to go back and get 20 more hundreds. I mean, you'd just be vending machine all the time, right? Everybody would be putting money in to get vending money out. But God himself promises that if you tithe, it'll go well with you in the land. It, that your harvest will come in due season. The rains will come. Your life, and, and it's not talking about rain and farms. It's talking about the blessings of your life will continue to flow and roll. And if you give offerings above the tithe, he will give you a 30, 60, 90, even a 100-fold return. You know what fold means? Times. That means I give 100, I get 100 hundreds. So the vending machine, you want 100 hundreds? Put in 100. We'd stand, I'd just stand there all day. I'd break the first pack open and just keep putting in those hundreds to get more packs. Wouldn't you? That's the blessing of God in our life. I've been doing this 48 years. My goal was always to give 100%. I've, I can't confess that I've ever done that. I had a conversation with the Lord one day, and he was blessing me for my giving, but it wasn't enough for me. I want to give more. You gave your all for me. You see, I think it comes to this. I think it's why it's so hard to trust the Lord is we're not sure about the price he paid for my forgiveness. Your forgiveness, you know, you. You say that. I don't, I'm not sure I believe what he paid for me. Therefore, I'm not sure I believe he'll take care of me if I give. That's really, I think it boils down to that. When I ask him, why is it so hard for the church to give? In my life, I've set myself up to try to be an example of giving and not taking. It doesn't work. What would work? To get people to be volunteering until they drop. Like, I'm going to volunteer until I, like, who was it? Uh. Someone was criticizing me recently about I'm going to work myself to death. What are you going to do if Steve works himself to death? I couldn't believe that question or criticism. Like, I can't tell you how much I want to work myself to death. I want to give until I'm done living. I want to do this. And if that's a criticism, I'm sorry. I'm not changing. I want to do this. I wish I had more to give. I wish I had more energy to use. I wish I had more time to use. To somehow be worshipfully grateful for what the price he paid to forgive me. I have no choice. I have no chance at standing before God and having him say, enter in, my good and faithful son. I have no chance of that ever happening for me without the price he paid. No chance at all. And I can stand in front of you today and say, the odds are pretty good. If I keep going the way I'm going... If I keep thinking the way I think, if I don't get deceived or angry or whatever, he's going to say, enter in, my good and faithful son. I don't know of a greater hope I have on this earth than that he would say that to me. And the only reason that I could even hope for that under any circumstances is the price he paid for my forgiveness. I didn't ask him to. I can't believe he did it. But he did. It's like it's done. I can't undo it. I'll either waste it or take it. I think I'm going to take it, don't you? And to take it, I need to be someone. That, what's this, this phrase? I'm just going to say the phrase again. She put in all that she had to live on. I haven't done that yet. But I want to. I want to put all of me in. He didn't walk up to a, a board and erase my sins. I had to weekly when I was a kid. I lied to my parents three times. I cussed a 
too many to count. I uh, didn't go to church. I didn't show up. I didn't go to mass one week. You know, bump. You know, and only probably Catholics in the room know what I'm talking about. And I, I had this picture of this board. And okay, if you say this many of that and do this many of that, they erase the. That's just not true. Nobody erases anything. I'm selfish. I seek my own life. I do these things. They don't get erased. They get paid for. Do you understand that? Can't do the time, don't do the crime. If you can't stand him doing the time, stop doing the crimes. Because he's doing the time for my crimes. I intend to never sin again that I may never put on him another sin. You say, the devil made me do it? You say, that guy made me mad? No, no, no. Nobody made you anything. Nobody made you not trust. People say, well, I was raised to believe in savings. I was raised to plan for retirement. Yeah, nobody did that to you. Once you came to a revelation of the price that was paid for you, and you said, I'll let you pay my price. I'll let you serve my sentence. All that I have is yours. All that other stuff people did and all that other stuff people do has to come off the table. You got to let it go. Forgive as you've been forgiven. Forgetting what lays behind, you must press on to what's in front of you, the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. And give what it takes to live on. I have no energy, but what I have I give to you. I have no spare time, but I think maybe I need to get rid of some stuff and have some spare time. Because I can't just give him spare time. If I'm going to give anything spare time, it's going to be fishing or it's going to be in my youth baseball or basketball. or If I'm going to give my spare time to anything, it's going to be hobbies. It's going to be serving myself. It's going to be doing what I like. But I'm going to try with all my life to have almost no spare time. Therefore, you'll find I don't have very many hobbies. Because whatever I have, I give to you. And I want it to be all that I need to stay alive. What I need to be happy, I give to you. I'm going to let you have what I need to be happy. I'm going to let you, I'm going to trust you for my happiness. I'm going to trust you for my peace. I'm going to trust you for my life. I'm going to trust you for my rent. I'm going to trust you for my food. I'm going to trust you for my life. Because no matter if it's a mite or a million dollars, to him it's nothing. It's simply you saying, I'm going to trust you. There is no amount of money that matters to God. It's, do you trust me, is what matters to God. It's what he's trying to teach these apostles, and in teaching them what they wrote letters about, will you trust him for all that you need? Why do you worry about what you'll eat or drink? Why do you worry about tomorrow? Tomorrow has cares of its own. Why do you worry about anything? Why don't you, don't you know your Father in heaven takes, will take care of you? If you want to become a person that this, these verses are describing, you want to become a person that these verses say God loves, then you need to be reading these verses. And I'm going to recommend you read the Gospels of Jesus Christ every day of your life. Read these words. Think of these words. Don't put Bible reading as one of the things you do when you have spare time. Put Bible reading as the thing you, the most, more important than going and earning money. More important than preparing food. More important than eating food or anything else you do. Make eating and drinking these words your priority as a service to him to get to know him and what he wants from you. Because how can I do what he wants if I don't know what he wants? They're right here. Come continually to the house of God, the body of Christ, his bride, and let us 
read these words to you and explain them and teach you their context, teach you about what's behind the curtain, and they will change you. And you will be born again. And where right now you're hearing me say this going, that don't work. I, think, I, I don't care. You know, whatever's going through, whatever struggle's going on inside of you, it will melt away if you will let these words transform you. He is the word that came down from heaven. John said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word was God. And later on he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the book of Revelation, it says, I saw a rider on a horse. On his leg was written, faithful and true, and his name was the word of God. He's the word of God, and these are his words, and you need to be ingesting them and reading them and being transformed by them, and you need to be giving beyond what you can afford to give. Putting yourself in a position of trust, you need to be serving, you need to be laying your life down. You need to be giving your time, your energy. I'm telling you, you may not like it. You may not come back. But I know for a fact today you were told the truth of what this means. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, thank you. Father, thank you for loving us. <laughs> There's even a chance we could be entered in as good and faithful sons and daughters. Thank you for paying the penalty in advance for us. For, Lord, we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none who have not sinned, no, not one. And yet you still love us, patient with us, calling us further up and farther in, calling us deeper and deeper, teaching us patiently, line upon line, precept upon precept. We surrender our lives to you. We surrender our hearts to you. And we ask you for your conviction this very day, Lord. Your conviction this very day on the areas of our life where we have held back from you and we're like the rich men looking to be giving to be seen instead of giving to trust you. Lord, convict us. Now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to ask, is there an area in your life the Lord is convicting you to change in on the subject of the widow's mind? giving what you have and as an expression of trusting him as an expression of I need you is there any area of your life that he's brought to remembrance he's brought to your thought process we're not going to take another offering don't worry just let the Lord touch you let him change you let him com continue to perfect you If that is you, would you raise your hand high and bold? Did the Lord convict you today that there's an area of your life you need to change in? Keep it up. Don't be lazy. Thank you, Lord. Would you just say thank you, Lord? You can put your hands down. Now, you raised your hand to the Lord. It's between you and him. I won't be counting. I won't be writing a list of whose hands are up. I won't be looking to see if your life changes. That is between you and him. But these are the truths that he's teaching. And would you pray after me? Say, Father, those of you that raise your hand, say, Father, I have heard you. I have felt my conviction that came from you. And I desire to come in line with your will. But I need your help, Jesus. Change me. I submit to you as my Lord. I will do. Come on, say it. I will do what you've asked me to do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord for a minute, would you? Thank you for watching the Father's House Oroville YouTube channel. But don't stop there. Please subscribe to our channel and help us spread the message of Jesus to all your friends and family by sharing our videos. You can also help support us financially by clicking the Give button. Thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you again soon.